That's very important. <laughs> that is important. Um, so, Mark, just so you know, in about 10 minutes, I'm going to be turning the presentation over to Chad Kushner. Chad Kushner, okay, that's fine. So, what we will need to do then is uh, for you to unshare your screen and for Chad to share his screen. Perfect. Okay. That will, will be fine. It'll all be fine. It'll all be perfect. Right. Okay. So mute is going now. So Lynn, you need to unmute now. Okay. So there should be a button at the uh, button at the bottom left. Where you can... Okay. Now I've there got it. Lovely. We're there. Good. Okay. Great. I've still got. All right. Good. Well, it's really wonderful to be here. I so many faces that I've known for so many years. Um, I was hoping Lou would open with a comment, but just having him in the room is wonderful enough. Uh, Sam LaMonaco, I saw your face up there a few minutes ago and remember our meeting in Torino with Lou. Gosh, that's quite a while yes, ago. Yes, absolutely. Good to see you, Lynn. Good to see you, Sam. I'm looking forward so, to your talk. Good, so am I. <laughs> well, I want to I wanna just make sure we have fun. What's going on? Um, you know, I don't know if you got, I was in lockdown for 99 days and I took it as an opportunity to um, just keep on keeping on. And it very quickly, let's see if I can get my screen to advance. Yes. Can, oh, this is the problem I was having before. Let me exit. Um, my screen is not wanting to advance for some reason. I'm not sure what's going on. If I push, I don't keep. <laughs> pardon, I, I'm trying that and it's not working. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna open the navigator window, right, slide fine. it over there so you don't have to, that's and, and you can still see it. So um, during COVID, during our lockdown here, as um, Andrew had asked, some of you may have heard us talking about a sound study that we're doing. You'll see a little bit of the logic for that in the beginning, but because of COVID, we, were, we absolutely had to stop that. And so I began to focus just on doing art and continuing a 19 year quest to understand the symbol that you see on the left, which is the flower of life. I'm sure most of you are familiar with it you know, starting from a single circle to the double circle called the Vesica Pisces Venn diagrams. So what I've known for so many years is that this two-dimensional symbol um, was telling us something about three-dimensional geometry and time. And so I began to, to paint to try to understand what I was sensing. So before I go any further, I'd like to just honor four people, actually eight people. First being P Luke Hoffman, who he and Pierre Noyes brought me to AMPA in 1998. Some of you will remember it was the first time I shared. John Amson, who was there, gave me the greatest gift. I've always laughed saying it because after, after we made a two hour presentation, there was silence and John Amson, bless his heart, asked the first question. And his first question was, how on earth did you keep your sanity mapping this level of complexity? And I began to cry. And I said, well, first, thank you for the gift. And he said, what gift? And I said, the assumption of sanity. So for John, and of course, our dear friend Dick Schaub. And I was with Dick twice, just in months before he passed. And the last time that he was with Lou and I was at NASA and we were showing them some of what we'll be showing you today. And the last thing Dick said to me was, Lynn Clare, you're a little bit going, don't give up. So in that spirit, I want to bring in another one of my muses, Buckminster Fuller. And you know, Bucky's vision, Bucky's hope was that integrity would be the hallmark of scientific discovery and that everything that we do, and since I live in a geometric, topological, knotted, knotted reality, would be done with integrity, open, transparency, and most importantly, for the benefit of all, not just humans, but all sentient beings. And that's 
that's what this is all about for me. So just some of you may not know or may not remember or haven't seen some of the newest work that we've been doing. So we're just going to give you a brief overview of, of what we're up to. I'm going to flip back up to this is the cover of our book that was done in, in uh, 19, 2018 rather. And so it encompasses this. So we're working at a dynamic whole systems model. You can think of it as a bubble on the outside with a, a carbon core in the middle. Let's turn on this little video here of the knot because that's the Marion trefoil knot. Now you'll see perspective. You may see the yin yang there and now we're going to rotate it and you will see something that looks like the Star of David. And as it rotates again, you will see something that is very reminiscent of Niels Bohr's The Atom, Model of the Atom. And the knot is literally, and Chad and I are working on this, the language between the 144 based polyhedron on the left and the 120 polyhedron in the center. Now, both of these polyhedrons are dynamic. They're not things, even though they obviously look like something. So this is what we're looking at. Some of you may not know that Marion, the Marion matrix, both the, sh the context and the core unites all the platonic solids, the regular solids and the Kepler semi-regular solids. And on the left of the screen, we see that it holds 10 tetrahedron fit inside, even though that's not how it works, so to speak. 10 tetrahedrons, of course, defines five cubes sharing the same vertices. We see five icosahedra, five octahedra. Only one dodecahedron fits in the system. It fills all of the um, input vertices. There are five rhombic dodecahedron and one rhombic tricontahedron. And what we're going to show you now is what's responsible for that. And most of you will know our Buckminster Fuller. Let me turn the sound off on that. There's a little bit of background noise there. The Jitterbug, uh, Carbon 60 uh, is so named uh, the, the Jitterbug, the Buckyball, because it's, it's jiggling. And of course, if they rupture it, they don't understand why it's doing what it's doing. But I'd like to show you what this 120 polyhedra, what we believe the best way to describe it's doing vis-a-vis -vis the Jitterbug. So this is looking at a straight edge perspective of that dynamic system that we call the outer boundary of the Marion matrix, the context. And so you can see it's very complex. You can see it expand and contract. It's breathing. So in 2012, before our first book came out, um, for <laughs> Lou has been hearing me say this for 25 years, that um, one day we will be able to put the Mary, the music, the Marian frequency into water and that in 10 drops of water, it will generate the Marian matrix. And everybody said, yeah, right, then Claire, okay, we'll see. So I'm going to show you the experiment that we did in uh, 2012. It's been replicated. You're looking at 7.97 Hertz. It's an inaudible frequency. Obviously, it's in the theta range, right on the, the cusp of, of alpha. And no one expected anything to happen. Lou was actually in the room um, when we did this experiment. So was his wife, Diane. Uh, Peter and Yuta McNair, many of our principal investigators were present. So watch what happens. No one expected anything to happen. I said, oh, Marion's going to show up. And they go, there she is. And what we're looking at is the output, the five-fold symmetry. And you're looking at 10 drops about, I can't remember, I'm sorry, the exact amount of water, but it's a very, very little amount. And I kept telling the individual doing the experiment, uh, John Stuart Reed, who was using the cymoscope, turn it up, increase the amplitude. And he said, it will blow up. And I said, no, it won't. It will blow up. So what if it blows up? It gives us all a little sprinkling and, you know, we wipe off your lens. So here's what happened when we turned on amplitude to full. It just rotated. 
So that was very, very exciting because we not only see the five-fold symmetry, we also see the three and the four, and there are knots implicit. So let's look at a different perspective of this same thing. The camera lens is focus center of the dish. And now you see the blue sphere appearing. You see it open. And you can tell that there's very little water in the dish. So here's some static shots lifted from that video. You can see there's a trefoil knot in the very, very center of that image. And in the images on the bottom right, you can see a definite weaving. Um, it looks like it looks like a ribbon. When we look closely, we see the blue sphere of light. We see this thimble um, dome arising. And in 2012, when we did this video, we did not see the slide that you see at the bottom, the last image on the right. It wasn't until 2018 that we had different software that we were able to look at. And that triangle is in the water and that light, the sphere of light is on the vertex. And what you're looking at, um, again, it's perspective driven, but it seems reasonable because that is the exact triangle that defines the Marion matrix. So if you have 120 of those triangles, you get this bubble that we're talking about. We continued our experiments with sound, and what you can see here on the left is our cymatic imaging of the human heart. And what I love is the two rings um, in that first top image. Um, it's, you know, metaphorically, you can take that for a long, long ways. And then they're sequential. You see what appears to be a plasma sphere. When Lou and I were at NASA with uh, Nick Wolf and Dick Schaup a few years back, and they saw that, when they saw 7.97 hertz, when they saw that and they knew it was plasma, that they were looking at it, they asked Lou and I, um, have you ever heard of sonoluminescence? And I remember Lou and I were standing on the terrace with the man who asked the question and we started laughing and I said, yeah, but I'll bet you never saw, thought you'd see it at 7.9, at less than eight hertz, basically. He said, no, nope, never did. So what we're looking for in these images is the logic of this Marion matrix, which is three, four, and five. So in D, you see the threefold. In E, it looks almost like a computer chip. And in F, you see the five-fold symmetry. So then we took the sonification of a human EEG to see what that looked like, imaging it in water as well. And we find the exact same logic, the three, the four, and the five-fold symmetry. And the bottom, J is one of my favorite images. No, excuse me, K is one, almost one of my favorite images because it's, it's 12 helices winding around this core of plasma. And I thought, well, maybe our brains are wired, wired for a 12-hour clock. So we have, we have uh, lots of videos of all those that we can show you if you're ever interested. So this summer, during COVID, Lou Kaufman and I talked, and I said, Lou, um, it was five years ago that a dear friend of mine, a rabbi, an Orthodox rabbi in Jerusalem, or actually in Tel Aviv, um, Isaac Bazinson, gave me the task. He handed me his copy of the Sefer Yetzirah. And Andrew, you'll find this interesting because it happened after he was listening to the, to the frequencies um, where we're playing them. And he said, I think this is your job to understand the Sefer Yetzirah, which is the book of Abraham, or it's the book of creation that's attributed through 5,000 years of, of um, oral tradition to be attributed to Abraham. But what's interesting about why it was important to me to, to do this was I saw the relationship between the tree of life, or between the flower of life and what was happening in the Sefer Yetzirah. So, sorry about that, let's get that back. So, this summer, or this, yes, this during the summer during COVID, I was painting as well, and I was intentionally looking to how to figure out how to find the five-fold five symmetry in the, um, in the flower of life. 
And the, the logic in Marion, as you can see in the image in red, is you see a five-pointed star. And if you look carefully at every vertex, every, all the five points, you will see a six-pointed star. So in the Marian system, fiveness is required, it requires sixness or three to exist. And my world literally turned around. Um, the day that I realized, as I was painting this painting, it's very, very large, it's almost a meter tall, as I realized that an in and out of every petal, or every petal on that flower of life is part of a very complex toroidal dance. And this is a small video that I did of how the knot turns inside out on itself. It does a dance like this. And my frustration <laughs> was I didn't know how to prove it. That was as close as I could come to finding the logic and lifting the flower of little flower of life from 2D into 3D. And then my world changed again when Chad Kushner, who's with us tonight, uh, sent me an email asking if he could play. And so we arranged a call, I think probably the very next day. And the first thing he said is, you know, he gave me his credentials. You'll learn more about him now. But he said, what can we do? And I said, oh, please help. Can you know the flower of life? And he did. And so, um, we began to explore and the world just kind of opened up because when he understood that I was looking for the heart of Logos and the heart of Sophia, which is what those two geometric forms that we that form the Marian matrix and the knot, which is the language of how they connect, it's what I was looking for. And so when we met, when we met, when I met, Chad already knew him when I met Brant. We formed something new and we call it the Emergence Network. And it's all about understanding all of our interconnections. So with that, by way of a background, thank you for your patience and letting me share that with you. Chad, I'm gonna stop screen sharing and turn it over to you. Chad, I can't hear you. Are you there? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Awesome, great. So Stand alone mic has its own mute. All right. So share your screen and uh, we'll. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so my name is Chad Kushner. Uh, I graduated from uh, the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs in 2015. Um, I have a Bachelor of Innovation in uh, Business creative communication and entrepreneurship. Um, since graduation, I've just been jumping from industry to industry, trying to figure out who I am, what my purpose is, where my skills are best applied and how I can really, um, and ultimately help humanity. And um, I found myself falling in love with geometry about two years ago. And I, um, I revere everybody's work and uh, truly believe that geometry is how the universe functions. Um, through my journeys, uh, I found the rhombic dodecahedron as a fourth dimensional hypercube, which led into the um, rhombic tricontahedron, uh, which is the most incredible shape in my opinion. Um, but through my explorations of the rhombic tricontahedron, um, I acquired a job back at the university I graduated from working for Dr. Alexander Seufer, um, famous combinatorical mathematician. Um, I run the, uh, the 2020 Mathematical Olympiad, his um, geometric journal, and I'm his administrative assistant on top of other stuff. But um, through that, I have deepened my understanding of geometry and really applied some of the animation skills that I've been developing. And um, when COVID hit, uh, I went all in on it. And um, through my studies of the rhombic tricontahedron, I, uh, pardon that, um, I've been studying tricontahedron in different projections. 
And through studying that, I actually uh, found Lynn Clare's work, and that's when I reached out to her. And so um, I'm going to share directly to a PowerPoint, if I may, um, just to kind of walk you through um, some of the basics. So this is this is one of the shapes that I've um, come to find. Um, this is, if you go on Wikipedia and you type in six cube, um, it's the rhombic trichontahedron in a D6 projection of its uh, uh, six dimensional hypercube form. And in here, you'll, you'll see that there's a significant amount of um, squished cubes and everything like that. And I'll come back to this later. I just wanted to show you, um, this is a model that I designed in Wolfram Mathematica and uh, subsequently had it 3D printed in gold. Um, now, when, uh, as I move forward, there's going to be some images that I will be circling back to. Um, so I would just like to preface them now just to, just to have them in your awareness. So um, I'm, I'm assuming the majority of you are familiar with Buckminster Fuller's work and the Dymaxion map. Uh, the, Dyma the Dymaxion map is a projection of um, how to take the Earth laid out in a coherent system that brings togetherness and not separateness based off the oceans. Now, the point of it is, is that you're projecting a three-dimensional uh, surface uh, sphere onto a two-dimensional plane, uh, in this case, a uh, icosahedron. Now, this is one of my most favorite images um, of Buckminster Fuller. Um, the artist is Art. Um, I, I have a problem pronouncing his last name, so I, I'm not going to pronounce it and butcher it. Um, but there's some things hidden in here that I will be coming back around to. And uh, you, you'll understand why a little bit later. And the third image is um, his three frequencies, uh, geometric um, geodesic dome and his synergy and behavior models. Now, this is something that I just really want you to take a look at because I will be circling back to this later. Okay. Now, I will be switching to uh, my program of choice, which is Blender. Now, with Blender, um, we, I have found that um, it is my application of choice. It is insanely difficult. It's not for everybody, but I seem to find an intuitive niche in there. So um, I have compiled a presentation format for you that has never been done before. So pardon me if I stumble through a little bit and uh, try to make this as coherent and clean as possible um, because I've really been trying hard how to best present all of these concepts to you guys. Um, and I think I have done a fairly good job of it. So um, let me just turn one thing on real quick. Okay, cool. That was acceptable to me. All right, so can you all see the little point on the screen? No. Lynn Claire, you're muted. Yeah, Chad, we still have uh, Bucky's three frequency. Oh my, this is one of those, oh, there we go. Screen one. Um, also, I am using a Ryzen 9 3900X with a um, RTX 2060 KO series. Um, the whole system is optimized specifically for this, um, and I honestly wouldn't be able to do half of this work without this computer. Um, so huge attribution to my computer because it's a champ. Um, and yes, so can you all see the um, single point in the center? Yeah, that's great. Okay. So um, from a single point, we want to basically just highlight the importance of a single circle. So it can go into a plane, but just the aspect of the single circle and its totality is important. Um, now, as we go forward,
we get a circle with a pearl going around the circle. Now, um, I'm going to turn this over to Lynn Clare. Um, she can explain this in such a beautiful way that, um, yeah, yes, Lynn Clare. Right, well, you know, so many people think a circle is something that connects us and what Chad and I are working on and doing this little illustration is showing how a circle, Chad, we need to go to the next slide, it just takes us around and around and around. And the minute you put two beads on a circle, one is, has to follow the other one, no matter which way. So as you can see, they're, they're not going anywhere, they're spinning. And in the next slide, we see what happens if they decide to go opposite directions. Then they just repel each other and they bounce back. And this is, this is the way a lot of relationships actually work. So it's just like playing ping pong with your emotions or, or how you think. So if we look at the next slide, it gets even more complicated when we add a third person onto that circle. And so it just, it begins to bounce and just continue. And the more people you add, the more complicated it gets because there's, there's always this opposition. And so what happens is if you get a circle that's just full of rings and someone's gonna say, oh, that's a nice necklace, I think I'll put that on. So the circle to me is a linking mechanism, but it's not a true form of connection because it restricts you to the plane. It restricts you into that, to that single dimension where it's follow the leader, go along to get along. And so what we're looking at with Marianne and what's so exciting about topology is that we see that this knot is a trefoil knot, but it's three dimensional, it lives on the surface of the sphere. If we were to thread all of these beads onto that knot, we would see a different form of interaction. So this is why this has been driving me, one of the things that's been driving me to lift the flower of life from those 18 circles up into 3D so that we could see the topology that generates the knot to find the connection. So thanks, Brent. All right. So um, here we have highlighted the 120 polyhedra. Um, this is the polyhedra that Lynn Claire showcased earlier. And right now it is on a procession to showcase how, um, how the 120 best orbits. Um, it, it's got a slight procession of 37 degrees, I believe. Um, and it just will keep going and going. Um, I also have it static here so that we can see the actual symmetry groups and so we see a, a mirrored symmetry we've got the five-pointed symmetry um, let me find a good angle for it there we go we have our three and six-sided uh, our three -sided symmetry. yep the three four five all right so then we get into the Marion 144. So um, each of these I've reverse engineered and made from scratch. Um, and it was quite the challenge. But um, here we see very similar um, symmetry groups. We've got the three, the four. No five. No five. All right, now from here. It fits exactly into a face centered cubic lattice. All right, now from here, uh, and I will let Lynn Claire take over. Um, we have the 144 inside of the 120. There's really, we're just showing the relationship if we, um, we're working on, on showing these things. This is an upgrade from what we did, oh my goodness, 20 years ago with, with my first geometric hero, Bob Gray, and, and show the relationship. But what we're working on, the Marian Trefoil knot is the language between these two geospheres. 
because what you have, that if you remember the animation of the five jitterbugs um, that are describe the dance, the motion of the of the 120, the context, the core actually has a vector equilibrium, a la Bucky. Uh, there are six, which means there are 12, there are six knots that through the 144. So it's, um, they rotate in opposite direction. Um, they expand and contract opposite of one another. So we would say that the outside, the watery bubble is the feminine principle and the inside is the masculine core. And maybe that you call the, the pattern, the knot, which is a rainbow, um, the third element. Great, Chad. Thank you. All right. Now, now we highlight the Marian knot. This is not easy. That knot is not easy. <laughs> it, it took so many hours of trying to manipulate this to get it very close. Um, one, yeah, it'll, it's nearly perfect. But um, here we have a, um, a truffle unlocked. Um, is it a, it's a three, two? It's the three, two truffle. Three, two truffle, okay. That means there's only, it's a torus. If you put that on the torus, and you move it by two hole. Okay. And here's this. Wonderful. All right. So now we have the main. And so, pardon me, I have notes. Um, yeah, so uh, this is to show the relationship between the knot and the 120. Um, and by the way, the fourfold symmetry is the octahedron. And what you will notice as he moves it around is that um, the knot, the vertices of the octahedron, there's five in the system, define the knot. And you can, we've, this is work that we've done. So we'll just keep going and Okay. Then we have the 144 with it. All right. And now we are back to a single circle. Okay. Now from here. Start that from here, from that single circle. We get the vesica Pisces. Um, so it's just going to loop between this and collapse in a second. So from the vesica Pisces, we have the flower of life sequence. as it unfolds. And the colors are being picked at random. Okay, so we have that same flower of life pattern laid out and we have it one, two, we have four iterations out. So we have a full plane of the flower of life. Now from here, uh, Lynn Claire 
when I ask Lynn Claire what I could make for you or what is something that you haven't been able to figure out how to create. She told me to make a single plane of the flower of life. And then she told me to take the plane and then orient the plane to 60 degrees. So now we have a plane at 60 degrees. Now from there, she told me to make six planes, I'm sorry, five planes of the flower of life. Um, just to kind of demonstrate what this is real time, I can increase or decrease however many I want. So you take this, and then it's already duplicated. There's five already in its position. And I'm going to spin it along the Z axis. And we move the first sphere, even though we don't have to do it now. Yeah. yeah. I, let, me, um, let me actually do that real quick. Okay. Because I can just Fine. quickly do that. I think you're starting to get a sense of why it's been so amazing the last couple of months working with Chad. Here we there go. we go. It's not pretty, but it works. All right. Oh. So from here, we take each of the plane and then we rotate it. Oh, come on. Oh, it doesn't like the Boolean. That's why. <laughs> it's okay. It's really not liking it. Oh, wow. Where is that even? Um, yeah, so take that and then as it accordion folds out. Uh, Lynn Claire, I'm just going to get rid of that. Yeah, that's fine. Just to Dude, use the bandwidth. Um, absolutely. Yeah, that makes it much easier. Yeah. Um, as you. Take the plane and you rotate it. You get this beautiful accordion pattern, which it in and of itself is just incredibly gorgeous. Um, so right now we're at 15 degrees. As we increase it, they start to overlap a little bit. And Lynn Claire told me to go to 72 degrees. So once I hit 72 degrees, it was incredibly apparent something was here, um, something I'd never seen before, something with symmetries that are just absolutely incredible. So if we go to the top symmetry, we get this beautiful five-pointed pattern. And if I drop down this, it becomes a little easier to see. And if we go to the x-axis for a side portrait, we get this amazing symmetry group at that 60 degree angle, this beautiful mirror symmetry. Along the y-axis, we have mirror symmetry down the center of it. And from there, um, I then took this, I, where all of the planes intersect, I dropped a vertice. And I did it manually one by one, just dropping them wherever the planes intersected. And what I found was this, or what we found. Uh, now,
um, just um, realization to lift. We turn that when we turned it into a um, a Taurus, some amazing things began to show up that that you don't see here. So take this and we got that right now in addition to finding this and i'm just going to circle back to this really quickly um we uh i don't know if it was by accident or what but i um i was able to take this and each of them are oriented on the x-axis at 60 degrees um then, in addition to that, I took each of individual faces and started rotating them. Them around their we rotate, and as we rotate, and as we rotate, we keep going, keep going, keep going. We're, we're starting to see that there's some chaotic interactions. And as I keep going, keep going, once we hit 22 degrees or 22.22, we start getting this interweaving effect that on the outside, there's yes, there, there's still some intersections here, but on the outer rings and as it keeps going further and further out, you get this interweaving effect, which if you take a look from the top down, okay, and... There's a definite... Okay, drop it. Okay, so if we take a look at the shape, right, and we have that crossing aspect of it, and then we go back to the solid shape. If we look from a top-down perspective, we get this. Now, um, I'm going to switch my screen share really quickly and go back to my PowerPoint, to the same slide I was on. Can you all see um, Buckminster Fuller's drawing now? It's there. So this drawing um, is a prediction of Buckminster Fuller based off of his geodesic domes and the three frequencies and synergy models with behavior. So um, we, can, we can see that we have the five-pointed star, we've got the triangles, and then we've got what looks to be this kind of lumpy exterior that's curvy, but it's clearly weaving in and out of itself. This one's clearly going under, this one's going over. So we have that interweaving effect. And um, as I, um, really quickly, actually, before I do that, come on, go back. I, I just want to highlight this image real quick. Okay. So if you look down here, and I know the screen share might be a little bit small. If you look down here and you look at his geodesic dome there, you see the top down image of what Lennon Clare calls the 345 projected in one of his geodesic domes. It's there. And so I'm going to switch back to, or how do I switch back? Why is it not letting me? There it is. Okay. As I switch back to my model, and I, I might be able to throw an image side by side. Um, let me do that real quick. One. Okay. So you can clearly see the similarity. And then I'm going to go back to the other one this, where we have that weaving. Okay. 
and you have that same over under over under on the edges of the five pointed star. So that over under is very clear here. Okay. Now from here we have that. Now I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint. So I, we've we've seen the um, what is called the three four five, and I'm I'm just going to before I do that, jump between the different projections so that you can see the symmetry group. So here's that same 60 degree cross symmetry. Here is that same middle symmetry. And one of the things that I noticed about this is, and, and you'll be able to see it too. Um, Lou caught it immediately. Um, and it's very apparent that even though it looks like these have flat faces, that's a rendering trick. That's not real. It, they don't, the, the way this shape is laid out does not actually have this flat face. The computer is interpolating and producing a false uh, layer to give coherence. And the computer strives for coherence as best as it can. This program really tries for coherence. And it's not always perfect. And the, it's doing its best and it's fantastic. And let me show you why. So if I go here, oops, ah, I turn it off. Okay. If I go here and we take a look at this wireframe of it, and I'm going to change this to be brighter. And we'll go with this. All right. So we have that same model in its wireframe form. So we look from the top. You have this beautiful, I'm actually going to change this again. So we have this beautiful cross symmetry. Oh, let me go back to it again. There's it 60 degrees. Here's it cross section. Okay. But if we take a look here, you'll notice that there's actually a bend. And that got me thinking um, because if it's not a real flat face, and there's clearly a bend and you could connect, you can connect this top piece to that vertice. So this vertice to that vertice, there would be a straight line down the center and it wouldn't be a polygon because then you'd have two senses. Now, when we think about nature, um, one, one of the things nature does is strive for the least amount of energy possible. And in talking with Lou and talking with some, uh, some of the other brilliant minds, and um, as I um, just really try to understand how geometry and um, everything works, um, I came across um, some research I'm just going to, of minimal surfaces. Um, and huge thanks to Lou on this. Uh, I didn't have the words to describe it prior to you. Um, however, uh, minimal surfaces really do bring a, a level of coherence shapes so that it, these parabolic curves that I will show you do naturally arise. And so here you can clearly see an irregular polygon that is not a flat face. And so 
with the definition of discrete minimal surfaces, specifically Kobe types, um, you are able to generate these curved surfaces that fill a irregular shape and an irregular um, pattern that you, you'll continue to see where um, what I'm about to show you derives from. Um, and I, I hope you'll be able to see it as well. Um, and come on, zoom in. So here's just a couple more examples. And this comes from uh, Alexander Bobenko. Um, I'm going to butcher his name. Um, and then Stefan. Um, I'm also going to butcher his name, so I apologize. Um, but these are all Kobe type um, minimal surfaces. And you can really see how, um, how they're willing to express itself to generate the least amount of energy possible to fill that surface. Here is. Um, some research by Alexander Bobenko as well, Tim Hoffman, Boris Springborn, um, and it shows circular patterns along with um, polygon patterns in order to express and showcase um, minimal surfaces on discrete polygons. So um, here's a wonderful example, and you'll be able to see it a little bit later um, of how that curving um, can be perceived. Then here's some computational aspects of discrete minimal surfaces showcasing something very similar. And then here's um, a model created by Alan Schoen from the Royal, in, uh, Royal Society um, showing a complex lattice and the minimal surface that would form from this type of shape. And you can see here that you get that natural curve that just nests right on top of the wireframe that is this model. I just realized that's paper. All right, so let me back to Blender. All right, so we have this wireframe. We have this model, and then if we take that same logic and we apply that to that wireframe, similar to if we were to um, suds up a a soap solution, softer version of the shape. And you can see we have that same kind of parabolic curve to it. And it's kind of hard to see in this mode. So I'm going to flip to my overlays. You can actually see the topology of this shape. And you can see that as I turn it, as I turn it, you end up getting this beautiful surface that just perfectly encapsulates this shape. And I, I hope you can agree that um, if this wireframe were to be um, printed um, and I were to um, place soap solution on it, that there would be a surface very similar to the quality of the surface you're seeing right now. Um, and I honestly fell in love with this because I, I've never seen a shape like this. And so in order to in order to further understand it, um, one of one of the things was could polygons Beep is that pop and so um, a um and so at the University of Lyon in France and the University of 
uh, Catalina in Rio de Janeiro. Um, they have done uh, extensive research with Springer and various publishers about the nature of parabolic polygons and discrete affine geometry. And um, with that, um, I hope you could agree that um, taking those concepts and applying to that, we could consider this, this shape by itself, a parabolic polygon, or as I would like to call it, a parabolagon. Um, just rolls off the tongue a little bit better. So um, as I just move forward a little bit, um, we're going to uh, go to the next shape. And okay, with that, game one. Oops. All right. So I realize my time's a little bit short right now, so I'm going to speed it up because I'm almost at the end. Um, so from from the original one uh, that I showed you, uh, I will. PowerPoint chat. Oh, I'm still on the PowerPoint? Okay, thank you. Um, all right, you can all see the flower of life. Okay, so from the flower of life, which one is it? Because it's still on. Okay, from here, we then take it and per Linclair's uh, suggestion, take it and then do that same accordion fold out. But instead of going to 72 degrees, we go to 60 degrees. And at 60 degrees, we get this amazing six sided shape. And we can take that same prop of the cross symmetry, the mirrored symmetry down the center, and then have that hexagonal symmetry here. Um, we can take that and apply the same concept that we did before. And dropping a vertice in every um, place of the connection. Um, and then we notice that there's still the same problem. We see that there's still faking, like a, a still a faked line going down the center and then one here as well, okay? So it's very obvious to see when we have the wireframe, um, especially right here. And- Let me just say that the reason we're doing the 60 degree rotation and why there's six of them is we are making the connection now from the, we started with the three, four, five related to the context, the bubble, and now we're relating this to the core, what I call the heart of logos. Thank you. The nucleus of the system. Now, um, if we apply that same logic and uh, uh, mm -hmm. that same concept of casting a bubble surface over it, we get a softer parabolic surface Parabola, you, you have your big face and you have it on these rhombic, rhombus faces. And we, we can really see that when we cap a wireframe on it. Let me get rid of this real quick. So you can see there's just a slight parabolic curve on this surface. And it's not very much, but it is enough to be recognized. So from here, um, one day we were on a Zoom call and um, I happened to just wonder what it would be to um, run a calculation on what the dual of the shape would be. And so um, I did Can so. I yeah, absolutely. I just like to say that on the three, four, five fold symmetry, um, just for your information, there's 22 faces. Thank you. 20 
and 40 edges. And this, what you're looking at here, is 32 faces, 30 vertices, and 60 mm -hmm. edges. Yeah, this is the 30 vertices. All right. So when I cast the, uh, or when I calculated the dual for it, I ended up arriving at this. Now, this is where there's still plenty of opportunity for me to, to continue this research. Um, because I have been finding challenges with my computer to calculate a minimal surface with a septagon, um, just slight challenges there. Um, however, if we put it on here, you'll notice that it fills the space. And while yes, it shows that it's calculating between two triangles here, um, it's something that I'm trying to um, better understand, um, but it's interesting that the dual has multiple septagon faces in various places. Now, that's with the three, four, five. And then with the next shape, um, Septagons with the three, 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 or the three, four, five, Chad? Uh, there were the three, four, five, and the three, three, three. So um, we, my computer calculated this one and solved for the dual of it in two different ways. Um, so it it did a septagon dual, where you have this fun paw-like pattern on it. Um, with a septagon, you have more septagons with this beautiful kite uh, uh, diamonds. And if I put the wireframe on and turn it off, it just goes straight through. So the symmetries are just stunning. And in addition to this one where we had this particular uh, base solved, we got a second result that is in my opinion, a little bit more stable, but offers a, a different perspective. So with this one, you have this incredible three-sided symmetry with these semi-irregular um, hexagons. And you still have the septagons, just like before, um, but the, the actual crown of the shapes were solved differently. And if we take away the solid and project it down, you still have that same through and through projection. So the only thing that it's all different for was the cap. And um, from here, I just have all of them right next to each other as a family photo. And then before I wrap this up, I would like to show you um, the dance that um, I think you'll all appreciate. So um, what you're seeing here is a mess. So hold on, let me turn this to render. Okay, back. All right, so this is the three, four, five in uh, its single ring form. So I can take away all of the rings um, and it's just the single ring and it's 60 degrees on the x-axis, 60 degree on the z-axis. Now, um, with this, I have the dancing flower of life. And you'll, you'll notice some beautiful other symmetries as well involved in this. And um, I'll, I'll, sh I'll showcase them after. Um, but let me just hit play. And it takes about two seconds to get going.
and it's going to restart in one second with this balloon. You can just see them interlocking and interweaving and dancing and playing. And taking that same dance and it here. I'll just jump back. So this is now the 333, um, the three, which is the six side. It's a very similar dance. They act very similarly. There's minor differences, but Jumping from a five-pointed to a six-pointed really does create an entirely different experience with something very similar. family photo. And I believe I am done. Um, Lynn Clear, is there anything I've missed or is there anything you would like me to say in addition? Great job, Chad. <laughs> so you. I think that's why we're all intrigued and now we'd just like to open it for questions. We can Maybe Chad, you stop screen sharing. That's great. And um, yeah, really appreciate it. Look forward to hearing your thoughts and questions. Thank you so much. That's absolutely wonderful. Um, Lou has got his hand up. Um, it, it does the flower of life uh, geometry give a different insight into the relationship between the original Marian knot and the geometry? We th we're we're working on it, Lou. <laughs> Be ready for the next. It's um, everything is everything is pointing there. What we got really excited about was when we saw the, the picture as well. The, oh, nice. I have a question. Uh, Sydney. <laughs> so. Oh wait, wait. Sorry, I wouldn't. Put your hand up. You I know, I know. I can't. I don't think we're on. I think we're on mute or something. No, we're not. You're not on they mute. They can't hear us. You're not on mute, right? <laughs> Lynn Claire, do you want to finish? finish talking first and then uh... yeah. um, we are really close we're building we you may have noticed in my first opening slide we showed some projective geometry that has a real interesting uh, relationship to the cosmic back radiation background um, so we're looking we've put the we have we have the 144 or the 120 rather uh, as a mirror, if you want to say, we're about to put the 144 in the center, so we will begin a reflective relationship. And so we think that the flower of life is going to help us in that regard. So Would it's you very like me similar. To pull up the video of the Infinity 120? Uh, not now. Okay. But, yeah, maybe you can pull it up, but and we'll screen share if we if we have time. Okay. I'll change my mind and say yes, please. <laughs> Peter Rollins, <laughs> person, <laughs> <It's not here. laughs> 
You're on mute. Sorry, I just noticed when you were talking about the intersecting circles and the flower of life, I'm pretty sure you're aware of this, but I don't know if you are, but do you know that um, Euclid's first proposition is two intersecting circles and deals with the um, equilateral, two equilaterals or one rhombus? Have you noticed that? That's just what I noticed when I was looking at your intersecting circles. And I saw that two circles, you look at the very first proposition in this first book, it deals with constructing an equilateral triangle. Very interesting, we'll check that out. No, I'm not familiar. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That's we love all the feedback. Would you put it in the chat so we can make yeah, sure? Yeah, sure, sure. Thank you. Uh, right. Vanessa, I see your hand waving. Yeah. Hi. Lito. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just wonder whether you're aware of something called the universal hexagram. It's something in the occult. Um, I'll I'll show it to you, but it reminds me of the Merian knot. Um, I just if I can share screen. <clears throat> oh. This is uh, some work that I did with the to try and help the Knights Templars of uh, well the Knights of Roslyn because uh, it became apparent they've lost their knowledge. So um, I was helping them. That's very that is the unicorn Instagram. You don't take your finger off. And where I track it to is, I can de define it within a cube. Now, the other, the other thing I was gonna say, I was, with the um, flower of life, um, I instantly built up um, into 3D. So it's actually made of um, spheres. And from that, what I discovered, Let's see if I can go through quickly and show you more of this. Um, yeah, is you can build across the cubes using this um, unicursal hexagram, and that's what it looks like when you hold it in a specific perspective. Yeah, um, and then you can form a hypercube of that. And that's the, the actual perspective again, um, you know, in the hexagonal perspective. Life, but also it um, gives you the ground plan of the Cathedral of Chartres and Rosslyn Chapel. It was quite amazing because I found this, I was looking at the flower of life pattern. The, um, the Templars of Rosslyn sent me the ground plan and I printed it out on a transparent, uh, uh, you know, a transparency and they happened to fall over and perfectly yeah. matched. No, I, yeah. yeah. I think the Knights nice Templars are into it. The tree of life, I mean, you mentioned that you were supposed to, Discover things. With the tree of life, the, the tree of life fits on a cube. I will um, share that um, if if someone else has a question. But we can actually show you how the sephirot fits on on. You can actually fit five trees of life on the. Let's see. No, there's twenty trees of life in Marion, and they all connect with the daat in the very center. It's the center of the system. The dot, the the eleventh yeah. wrote, and so it perfectly lays out and it perfectly aligns with, as you said, Chartres, Rosalind Chapel. So yeah, we're all on the same track. And the actual symbol that the Knights Templars use, they showed me one on the desk, and it opens up, but it's using that same pattern. It's it's the, one of the secrets that they carry. Well, the but if you look at Chad, if you could put up the 144 and show the, the cubic symmetry from the top, if you look at the 144 of the matrix uh, from the, the cubic, from the exactly the count and cross, exactly. Yeah. That's right. Um, <laughs> it's, I, it's just I, been 
connect ancient wisdom and modern science because the complexity of this modeling that we're looking at, both the geometrical aspects and the topological, are, are quite astonishing. And Bob Gray is looking at, at this, at the knot in particular as being the orbital spin of the electron, which our friend um, uh, Sasha Shogun said, don't ever forget that this is the orbital spin of everything in that action. But let's rotate it to where we see us. That's not quite it. We need to, there, it's, <laughs> I'm, I'm pointing at the screen and thinking, you can see me. There you go. There you go. No. No. Should. It's, I, it I should, can't see. Hold on. Okay. There's a there's a there's a perspective chad where it looks like almost a square. And the Templar cross stands right out. Do I this, this is the one forty four? Yes it is. I don't know why it's not quite showing up. Is this it? Oh, well, uh, uh, yes, it, it actually is. And it's the shadowing, it's the shading that makes it a little hard to see. Oh, yeah, let me, let me change the shading real quick. Yeah, the shading, the, Vanessa, can you see the cross? Right in the center. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> me and a friend really side. Oh, why is the shading? The, the the on the uh, down slope from the vertex, so we could we could color it in. But anyway, thank you. Yeah, great great feedback. Okay. Okay. Yep. Lovely. Any other questions? I've I've got a question. Um, th these are obviously oh. structures. What does it tell you about time? <laughs> One of my favorite questions. Page 33 of his book, The Universe in a Nutshell. Do you have that bookmark? No. Okay. Stephen Hawking wrote a book in 2006, I believe it was, called The Universe in a Nutshell. And Lou and I were at Cambridge. It was Jim Hardall's 60th birthday party. Remember that, Lou? And 1999, as I recommend, um, we were sitting, we were in the room, and of course, Stephen Hawking was there, and he was speaking, and oh, the energy of that man was absolutely amazing, but afterwards, there was a reception, and, and Stephen Hawking was sitting in a corner all by himself, no nurse, no one in attendance, and I remember I said to Lou, why is Stephen Hawking sitting in a corner all by himself, and he said, because Nobody knows how to talk to somebody who can't talk back. Mm. And I said, I can. He said, go talk to him. And so I did exactly that and had the most incredible experience with him. So it's always been significant. I told him my story, to, you know, told him Lou and I were working together and what we were working on. I showed him the knot. And so it's always been very significant to me that a couple years later, um, in his book, The Universe in a Nutshell, on page 33, he shows a trefoil knot inflated. Now, it's like he put a bicycle pump and pumped it up, but that's not how it works. And he put the trefoil knot inside of a nutshell and said, the trefoil knot is the um, close, it's the only it's the closest representation that we have for understanding time because it's asymmetrical, but it has perfect symmetry. And when I came back from, you know, all of this started with a near-death experience and I've been able to remember all the pieces and put them all back together again. And that's, um, it, it's still unfolding as you can see, we're still demonstrating stuff. But I came back saying I saw this the strand of the tapestry weaving all creation. I said it's time. So 
time is like a rainbow. Time is real. <laughs> you know, some of us, Lou and I, and Lou, we've been tracking for 25 years. I've known some of you. Vanessa, I think I first met you. It's probably close to 20 years ago. Hard yeah. to believe. Yeah, hard to believe. And so, you know, time, we don't see it, but we see time on our faces. We see, we feel time moving. I feel time accelerating. So I, it's, it's like a rainbow. It's real and it's true, but it's not a thing. The geometry we're looking at is not a thing. There, there's, there's mass in the, the carbon core that we can't see. I think it's very interesting, this jitterbugging model that we're following with the 120, that Marion is hidden from us. It's just like the sound is inaudible. It's hidden inside of an icosahedral shell. And that's why I've always said it's a virus of love. So if this shell is real, then time, which is invisible, inaudible, knows everything, connects everything, then I think what we're looking at Vis-a-vis the nod, I would suggest to you that we might consider it as a template for understanding time. That those who experience otherness, that we share space, but that within our universe that we're looking at five discrete but interconnected tracks of time. So I mean, that's my answer. So okay. I think that it's the moving species of space. It's not a thing. I mean, the knot is just, it's like if I put my finger in the air, it's pointing up. And if I move it, it creates an arc. And so I believe that the arcing angles that are the geometry that, of course, when they're spinning, it's just a sphere. We see a sphere of light that, that the time carving itself in space. So, I mean, one of the things that strikes me about the, the um, vibrating water and, you know, all of that nonsense, I mean, it's not, non not nonsense at all, um, but one of the things that strikes me is that there, it's an interference pattern. You've got an interference pattern which is geometric, it has a structure. That's, that's right, isn't it? And it's three, it's 3D. Yeah. It yeah. is not, um, it's definitely 3D. 3D. You can see it's clear. So it's like um, we tend to make a distinction between um, structural, synchronic aspects of um, reality and a temporal, diachronic. But actually, in your in your pictures, those two dimensions coalesce. We are you know, in our book, Thousand Pages, it took us five years to write the, the, fun, the principles, and there's only 12, or maybe it's even 11. There's only, and the first one is that there is a spatial temporal nexus, and, and so that connects everything. And so I think they, there is a coalescing in precisely the way that you would say, Lou, you can unmute yourself and maybe make a comment about this. Mm. Uh, I don't think I want to make a comment about that. Okay. Could, could I say that I quite like your idea because the uh, the human uh, the human body has three body clocks. The human body has three what, Peter? Three body clocks. Three body clocks. Yes. So I like your idea about the. Uh, this is this is. A, something like, um, well, in inverted commas, the geometry of time. Well, I, I, will, I will tell you one other thing um, that's very interesting is about the rabbi. Did I, I don't know that I mentioned it before. If I did, you can stop me. But um, after I played the, the frequencies, the sound that we translate, we, because of the mathematics, we're able to make the inaudible audible. And I played this for an Orthodox rabbi in Tel Aviv. And two hours later, uh, after I left, I got a phone call from his wife, Devorah, saying, you have to come back right now. And she hung up on me. <laughs> so I knew it was urgent, come back right now. And when I got back to their house, when she said, 
You're in Fort Now, girl, when she met me at the front gate. And so I went in and there were three men in there. Two were physicists from, one was from the Technical University in Tel Aviv. One had come down from Jerusalem and the other had come down, uh, the other was his son actually, who was a scientist as well. And they said, what was the sound that you played for the rabbi? And I said, well, it's the frequencies that we believe are associated and resonate with the knot, with the Marian knot. It's what it's, this is all intuitive. We're now unfolding some of the logic about this. This has been going on for many years. We've been looking at this. And I said, what's going on? And Rabbi Isaac, had something against his chest and I didn't know what it was. And he turned it around and he said, have you ever seen this happen before? And it was when I left, he went to his office to pray for it was time for his davening. And he walked into his office, making, looked at the clock to make sure that the time was correct. And the rabbi's atomic clock was running backwards. And it ran backwards until the seventh day. And on the seventh day, it turned. There's witnesses to this. It's Rabbi Isaac Basinson in Tel Aviv. His wife, Devorah, is an American. And um, two days later for dinner, and he painted me a, a painting. He's a, um, a painter in the school of Marc Chagall. He's very, very famous in Paris. He is French. And this is the painting that he painted for me. And can you see it? Mm -hmm. I'm trying to avoid the glare. I'm sorry for the glare. And he said, the rainbow in the background is Marion. And he said, you're not the woman in the background. He said, you're Noah. <laughs> so it's, um, so I've always thought of the rainbow as time and a promise. So something about those frequencies changing an atomic clock to, and the physicists couldn't explain it other than that an atomic clock is apparently uh, set up to some something in frequencies. So it's an adventure. It's been an adventure for a long, long time, hasn't it, Lou? <laughs> Uh, anybody, any, any other questions? My in internet connection is very bad, I'm afraid. So I'm hoping that this isn't too broken up. Yeah, I have a question. Is, is there a, a permission you can give so that someone can send a file into the chat? Oh, I don't know whether there is. Um, um, hang on. I don't think there is, Lou. I think the best thing would be to attach a file to a message in the ample list, perhaps. No, I'll do that later. I located the beautiful Stephen Hawking uh, oh. knot with little trains running on it. Oh, uh, so <laughs> I'll send it in ample chat. Okay. Uh, Dave, you mind? Your mic is you. good. Hi. Uh, God, uh, thank you so much for the presentation. And uh, honestly, like, Chad made it look so easy, but that that was that was a lot, uh, and I really appreciated that. <laughs> that 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 was a lot of work, uh, and it really shows. So thank you for sharing your enthusiasm uh, as well. I had a question about the angle of uh, you know you put the, the twenty two degree. Angle and which is approximately around that neighborhood, like 22 to 24, I guess, or that was more specific number that was, but you did mention like two or something. I'm curious about if, if you if you are also thinking about that connection uh, and within the symmetry groups, and, and I don't know if, if that's a question. In the, uh, that you when I wrote my first book in 1996, that was published in 97, um, it was actually one of the first things that I said in that book. And, and, you know, I was speaking from my experience and I had, I'm not a scientist by background any more than Bucky Fuller was, but, um, you know, 
I can only describe what I can see. I remember Lou Kaufman once asked me to put the knot in my hand and tell me what it was doing. And I put my hand up like this and immediately went like this and went like this. He said, oh, it's like a gyroscope. And I said, yes, but it's spinning at the same time and it's, it's moving that way and it's, and it's doing this. So there's actually three motions, which Peter made me think about when you said there's three body clocks or body awarenesses. So, um, yeah, it's, it's definitely there. Um, I actually think the earth, I think, you know, humans, I think we're so out of sync with the rest of the universe. And I think we need a, an inner change in our frequency and our attitude and to change as a collective to maybe realign ourselves and ourselves as, a, as individuals and as a whole to bring ourselves back into into alignment so yes we've definitely thought about it and you know these are just questions you know i don't have the answers but i think the marion matrix by showing us the sequential nature of how the universe builds um is giving us the questions to ask so that we can find our answers and find our answers personally and collectively well well i think again you you hit the word there. You said we it's like a gyroscope. We're like a gyroscope. We're 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 balanced. We're 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 balanced when we're, bo we're born, and we gradually uh, uh, gradually when when we die, the got the gyroscope falls over. Yeah. I call it dynamic balancing. The last thing I want to be is balanced. Balanced, ED, that's dead. You know, balancing is to be in continual motion. It's, it's like a dynamic, it's a dynamic balancing. Absolutely, dynamic balance. Yeah, against all the uh, all the forces around us. Absolutely. To keep our uh, to keep our, to keep us uh, dynamically level and uh, mentally um, uh, alive. Absolutely. Okay, uh, Rachel. Um, question. Mark, can I ask a question? I think Rachel's first, Mike. I, I think okay. so. so. So, Rachel, then Mike. Oh, yeah. Um, I just wanted to say that I read your book like five years ago and I pulled it out because I heard you were talking the day. I was like, oh, I still have it. But I just really admire your. Yes, I guess, like, wow. <laughs> 20 years ago, Rachel, I read that book. <laughs> no, but it was cool um, to see like. The beginning of it and you have like this like courage of like I have something to say but I just have to figure out the language so it's great to see you're like still going with it 33 years later <laughs> okay so Mike and then Richard uh, then Claire just a, a, a maybe it's a very basic question the Schumann frequency with there's several of them that take the lowest one it's remarkably close to the number you were talking about, right? 7.83 hertz. And I can Have you any thought of any, any difference there? Um, yes, but in the number, there's a sequence of numbers, and I can't share them with you, but it's the first frequency, what we call the priming frequency, that generates the Marian matrix in water is 7.97 hertz. And that's what you saw in water. One of the frequencies, um, is, is 7.82 and I would submit that that is um, where the Schumann cavitational resonance should be stabilizing is it is is that one one hundredth of a degree were off if you take 7.96 hertz or 7.98 hertz the Marion matrix is not there in the water if you resonate the water if you're off one one hundredth of a hertz the pattern is not there so that that level of precision is where we're hanging so i don't believe the priming frequency i think the priming frequency that we looked at is is us not global and that i would submit to you that 7.82 is going to be somehow relevant well as the saying goes good enough for government work right <laughs> <laughs> okay, Richard. Um, so uh, a Buckminster Fuller dome 
consists of uh, pentagons and hexagons. And the soccer ball also with pentagons and hexagons. Um, the question is, why are those two settings restricted when you've been demonstrating sevens and nines and various other things? Well, we've only, we found the sevens um, in the, in the parabolic and in, in do, following the flower of life and that toroidal patterning to the flower of life. It was a surprise. I mean, Chad can tell you it was like, sevens? Are you kidding? The only person I know who's going to be happy about finding a seven is John Amson. <laughs> so it's very interesting because we've never looked at that. Now, Buckminster Fuller, the whole problem that you may know about his, his jitterbug, if you ever saw a Bucky Dome, A, they fall apart really quickly because they leak. They leak at the vertices. And so, you know, he was trying to take a, something that was dynamic and make it static and make it stable. And so the fourfold symmetry in the Marian matrix and what we're looking at is what gives it stability because the three, which is a six cutting, I call it a three because that's what it is at its minimum, Richard, is, is a three. And so that defines your tetrahedron, which the tetrahedrons are not on the inside, although they, they scale down to a tetrahedron infinite inside, but the tetrahedron is the only thing that can like go through that door. So when you, um, the threefold, it's open, the fourfold symmetry, the octahedral symmetry, and of course that fits with the rhombic dodecahedron as well, is the stabilizing symmetry in the Marian matrix. And that's where the system closes. And then the fivefold symmetry, it opens up. So it's like breathing. There's input, there's throughput, and there's output. But it has to stop. It has to there has to be an open and a closed. I mean, we think about breathing as inhaling and exhaling, but what about that whole big process where on the inside we're utilizing that breath? So that would be what I submit is part of the missing pieces. If you look at this as an eight step systemic diagram of energy coming in, energy being bounded, compressed, condensed, expanded, you know, put through a process of what we call prioritization, reordering, then put into time, and then coherence, which Chad's favorite form the, and mine, the rhombic tricontahedron, is making, you know, it's the three fivefold symmetry of input and output. Do they match? And if they do, out the door. So it's, it's a dynamic whole system model. We're um, in the middle of writing a book presenting this um, as answering von Burton Lanfe, who was looking for a dynamic, unified whole systems model, which we certainly have a candidate for that. Seven is Octonians. Sorry, Peter. I love. Seven is Octonians. The imaginary part of Octonians is seven. Say that again. And that's the next step up after three, which is Quaternions. Yeah. Three, four, not is basically quaternions. Seven is octonians. Seven is octonians? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the imaginary yeah. part of octonians is seven numbers. And that's the next step up to after quaternions, which are three imaginary parts. That's very exciting. Like yeah, I we're, said... We're clear to see that. Um, uh, quaternions is one, and I and J and K, that's three, right? When yeah. you go to Octonians, it's one and then seven basic generators. Now I understand. I know. I got it. Okay. Good. Also, we um, in one of our talks, Peter, Peter and mine, we have um, maybe I'll share screen again briefly, if I may. Um, we have. Can you see this? Hello? Sure. Yeah, it, yep. this is the, um, the scatter graph of DNA, and that's the outline of the rhombic by fried contagion. Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, with the point pull on, it overlays perfectly. Yep. And, yep. and also, yeah, that's. Uh, uh, Yes. 
That's one of the quasi crystals. So yeah, there's more <laughs> in there anyway. Well, it's definitely time. Um, we're definitely unfolding some remarkable new things and finding coherence with what you're all sharing is very exciting. And we know we're about to take a quantum leap. I think COVID has just been this amazing gift. I mean, I've had Lou Kaufman on Monday, on Monday evenings, you know, habitually. And it's just fantastic. The only time I haven't had him for several months is, is because of AMPA. So when he said, well, you present an AMPA, it's like, of course I will. <laughs> so we've been, you know, we're really having a great thing. And, you know, the fact that we were doing the Sefer Yetzirah and, and on one hand, and I'm doing the Flower of Life on the other. And, and one of the big mysteries, and you may know, in the Sefer Yetzirah is about the 22 letters. And boom, what do we find? We find the 22 based polyhedron and now knowing the relationships between sevenness you know not ijk and making that next step up wow that's very exciting to me so please we're opening this this is an open investigation we've been doing i've been doing this for 33 years dick shop called me the cosmic energizer bunny and she will never stop <laughs> And I, I won't stop. And Rachel, I'm just so honored that you, you actually brought up that book. It's been 22, 24 years ago I wrote that book. And I've not talked about it. And it's just like, okay, get over the story because it, I can't, if this is real. I need people like Lou and, and Pierre Noyes and John and, and, all, and Bob Gray and Chad you know, to, to, to make it, to find out, is it true? Does it work? Disprove it. And, you know, if you have another minute, I'd like to introduce one more person. He's, he's, Chad and I have built this play box, and Brant came and joined us. And Brant is just a master. How many of you have ever seen augmented reality? Mm -hmm. Would you like to see augmented reality of the 333 or the 345 blooming it. in his garden? Go for it. Chat, Brant, Brant, share the screen. Take it away. So meet Brant Hinman. He's calling in from San Francisco today. Yeah, we have a good time talking, as you can imagine, with Chad in Colorado. I'm in Spain and Brant is in San Francisco. I can't tell you how many nights I fall into bed just <laughs> on arrival at midnight or one o'clock. Brant, welcome. Thank you so much. Great, great being with you all. Um, actually, I'm opening up uh, the video on Signal. It's a little bit difficult to do augmented reality in <laughs> real time over a conference call, given all the technology and such. So um, let me share my screen and I will pull up a video, just a quick 30 second of uh, this in my backyard. Should be good. Great. Make it as large as you can. There you go. Great. It's coming in. So we're actually able to uh, blow this up and walk inside of it and have it genuflex and rotate around us, you know, so we can actually get inside of it and explore the, uh, the inner topology and. Um, uh, structure of it and it's um it, it's quite fun to be a part of and uh quite inspired by you all so the animations that chad shared we've got that where you can open it on your phone and you can project it you know under your hand into the middle of the room and you can make it as big you can augment a reality you can go inside it's just astonishing at the right time, uh, we have a QR code that we could certainly send out, and people could bring this on their phones, you know, directly. Um, and so it's, it's, it's ripe for experience. Okay. 
Wonderful. Thanks for the introduction. Thank you very much. I have Any more questions? About, yeah. Uh, yes. I have a question about the surface, the minimal surface, and I'm wondering if uh, if you have a concave and a convex version, like if it's if it's doing this, but also it could be like a poofy one, as opposed to like. Uh, but I don't know if, if there is a specific reason why it would it would do it would do it like this as opposed to that. You know what I mean? You know, I want to say this, Diamond. I thought I read that question because Tad and I were talking before and talking about a bubble. And Marion is breathing. Standing in fact, as you saw in the jitterbox. Yeah. So, my quest for 19 years since someone first showed me Tree of Life, um, a Santa Human and the Flower of Life the three things I saw all at one time and I, I had to put those pieces in it. But I said, this has to be the heart of logos and the heart to see But the heart beats. It has a pulse. It has a pulse. So I suspect that we will find exactly what you're looking at and we will find the logic for that as well. Just as we did the 120 and the 144, how did they breathe? It took us a long time to figure out that it was the jitterbug. We may well be looking at a different dynamic, but I suspect that if Chad prints the 3D model that we're talking about printing and does the soap bubble, that uh, it will be convex and concave just like the Marion Matrix does in the dynamics. Yeah. The way I was imagining how you were describing it, um, how do you pronounce your name? Um, oh, you I, I go by Sahu because it's easier. Uh -huh. but yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, what I was imagining, uh, Sahu, when you were describing that was um, a diaphragm. Uh, the literal lungs that you can breathe in and out. And um, if I were to take that model stick a straw in there and blow into it and take take those surfaces and kind of like push them out. I see ex exactly what you're talking about of having that like slight convex aspect of it. Yeah, I, I, I'm just curious because I was I was just wondering if there was a reason why the surfaces were, were doing that as opposed to this, but then uh, thinking about it as breathing, as, as going through one to another or moving is, is helpful to like maybe imagining it uh, in that uh, jitterbug type uh, uh, gesture. Uh, yeah, interesting. Thank you for sharing uh, these visuals. Thank you. <laughs> to start the day. <laughs> Here. And, uh, so my question is uh, related to the title of the talk. When you came up with uh, COVID-19 and also started all these um, geometrical projections, I expected you to draw vertical lines, sorry, to draw lines between all of the vertices of the COVID uh, virus image that we used to and come up with some mathematical understanding of what that might mean. Is that <laughs> uh, You know what? I think, I think there's, um, there's a big wide open discussion about what is a virus and what's happening to a virus. And it's a discussion that one of our team members, Dr. Peter McNair, is a medical doctor. His wife is a biologist. And we have had lots of talks about this because the icosahedron, which is the preferred structure of the shell, the capsid of a virus, shows up in two places. That architecture is found in two places. Um, it shows up in um, energy comes in and then it passes, and we can actually show you um, an icosahedral shell that happens in the interior um, prior to lifting up for stabilization into the octahedral realm. And then as it goes through the progression of the geometry, we, ident we use the geometry to identify steps of the system. Or if you can imagine it, it's like a click stop, it's like a relay race handing off as the vertices exchange. And then the entire system is hidden inside of a single icosahedron. 
And when that's happening, there's dodecahedral daughters, we say, that are birthing. The system is depending. So I think in terms of a virus, I've said for, you know, Rachel, if you go back in my book, you'll find that on February the 14th, um, when I was, 1991 is when I remember, I said to the person standing there, what, what is it? She said to me, it was a woman, we know who it was. It's the pattern of healing. And if we understand frequency and we understand vibration, I think we're on to a new medicine. I will tell you right now that I'm going through some very serious medical treatments. Do you see this disc on my neck? Can you see that? My body is covered with those right now. And if any of you are interested, it's a frequency that's being put into my body because I'm dealing with major inflammation. And it's partially from air pollution because I live in Marbella and I'm in the top of the city. And it's I'm working, it's called anffrequency.com. And Dr. Dr. Mikkel Hoff is a Swedish doctor using vibration, using frequency uh, for healing. I could barely breathe so, and was just not doing well. So, frequency. You lost your sound. You lost me? You just lost your sound, yeah. Okay, am I back? Yeah, you seem to be. Okay, good. So I do believe that there is a lot to be learned about viruses. I think, you know, things that stuck. If a virus can't be off, it's, you know, it's injured, it's blended, it's compressed. I call that opposite of gravity. It's like enough to be even. Uh, gravity. When we get, when we start taking things really, really seriously, we lose our balance and we get this virus of fear. You know, a system is a system is a system. Our colleague Nick Wolf said, we must always remember that we're living systems, but we create these things called relationships, families, businesses, organizations. They're lifelike systems and they're going to be as healthy as we are. And so, a lot of the things that we extrapolate, it's when I read Stephen Hawking's, I loved his smile when I told him, you know, I read your book, A Brief History of Time, and I read it as a book that was all, it was telling me about relationships. So if you have that book, get it out and look at it. Hmm. Again, and read it at every level. Peter Collins, lady, I'm sorry I can't remember your name, but you've been so patient with your hand up. Yes. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, so is it possible to develop these new um, relationships and ratios between these new types of solids? Is it possible to do a Euclid's version, Euclid's elements version two, and classify these lines that, like the radii into, like, Medial straight lines, apotomies, and have the classification of irrational uh, lines as straight lines that form the sides of the, the ratio of the sides of the, uh, the solids to this radius of the sphere. That's what I'm trying to, in a roundabout way, I was just trying are, to. Are you, are you talking about all the golden ratios and all of that that occurs in the regular solids? Is that is it those, yeah, those kinds something of results? Like yeah, yeah. Like well, well, yeah, they, uh, they can be, they're not hard to prove okay. uh i don't know if anybody wrote a book about them but the, uh it, they aren't hard to verify well, what's interesting in your question is that you know in the mary matrix every point every edge every face um even if it's square root to not golden ratio it, in the mary matrix all 62 uh is all is pure gold Pure golden ratio. The number that we're dealing with is pure golden ratio. Uh, it's going to be very interesting to look at. We, you know, we're just evolving the work that showed. Very interesting to look at those ratios. Mm -hmm. 
infer that and see where the golden ratio shows up in there. So it's, it could be that we're looking at category of some sort, and the ratios, it would be very interesting to see how it fits. One of the things is we'll be taking those new products and putting them inside the matrix to see where the vertices line up, to get an understanding, to begin to look at the layers, to find out there's only one fit and more than one. And we'll do that for the 144, we'll do it for the 345, 22 phase, 120 phase polyhedron. Because remember, the, what I didn't mention is the 120 phase polyhedron is at its minimum. That's when the system is closed because when it's breathing out, it has 180 phases. The nucleus, when it's closed, and it's at its minimum, it has 134 phases, just because it's the only squared Fibonacci number. 144 phases, but interestingly enough, when it expands, it goes to 300 phases and becomes a pure icosahedral. It's icosahedral. Very interesting. So, again, Richard, that's another place the icosahedron shows up. You know, it's three, there's actually three times where we have icosahedral structures. All right. A comment, Sydney? Yeah. Here's, here's an exercise. Size for you. These are, this is three golden rectangles orthogonal to one another put in symmetric, in symmetric form. The vertices form an icosahedron. You can see the strings between them, but the exercise is to prove it. You take three golden rectangles and work out the distances between the vertices and find that it's all equilateral triangles. So you made an icosahedron. That, that's that next uh, theorem that isn't quite in Euclid, or maybe it's implicitly in Euclid. But uh, uh, but but that would be the next step you would like to oh, take there. Okay, thank you for telling me that. <laughs> this is this model, by the way, is courtesy of Stan Tenen long okay. ago. <laughs> you see, it's marked with Hebrew letters and all. Left as an exercise for the student. Yes, yeah. Right. <laughs> Okay, folks. It's um, it's seven o'clock here. Um, it's, uh, we, where are you in Spain, Linclair? I am. I'm on the Costa del Sol. I've been oh, in nice. for four. Yeah, it's lovely. It's better, better weather than we've got. I'm <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, can I can I say thank you ever so much for a, a truly wonderful. Not right now because COVID is kind of a mess down here. Yeah. We really appreciate it. Thank you for letting us share. Anyone who wants to play, you know, I'm still L. Dennis at Marion.org. Lou knows how to get in touch with me. Um, Chad and Brant and I are continuing on. I'm in the middle of writing a book on this so far, you know, other than Bucky's planar diagram suggesting this three, four, five that he thought had to be there. Um, they're not identified. So we're writing it, we're doing a couple of interesting projects about it, and we look forward to sharing that. That's great. Okay, I'm gonna apologize in advance because I think my internet is still very bad. But the investigation is wide open. Young people, it's, it's, it's up to all of us now. And I think this virus is an opportunity for us to all, you know, do our inner work and then come out and play in this new format. I mean, Lou, I remember when we couldn't even afford to pick up the phone call when I left the U.S. 20 years ago and moved to Denver. Denmark. Oh my gosh, phone. And I'd have to think about them all around the world and we're talking free. So let's talk freely and openly and, and transparently. Because we have the knowledge we can make for letting us be here tonight. Chad, do you want to say anything? Thank yeah. you very much for the audience and 
um, for enjoying and watching the presentation. I, I appreciate it. We appreciate yeah, it. Absolutely. Good. So send your video on. Let's keep this dialogue going. I've been I've been watching some videos and um, who was the doctor from UCLA that did the talk on biosystems? That was John Torday. John was his name. John. Torday. Oh, fabulous. I'm so excited. I was sorry I couldn't be there that day. Mm. Um, well, thank you. Okay. Paul? Mark, you're breaking up. But we I, I know. Uh, so I'm going to apologize in advance because analysis. I think the video is going to be a bit broken up today because my internet is terrible. But um, we'll do our best. Perhaps we can make a video of our presentation and share with the group. <laughs> that would be great. Okay, well, I'll see you all tomorrow. Yeah, We've got Leon, Leon Conrad tomorrow uh, talking about logic and laws of form, I think. So uh, hopefully... Okay. Uh, this is crazy. Well, I think it's... Let's see. Why you can type the... announcement on that. Right. Okay, I'm gonna say I'm gonna say goodbye. So we'll see you all tomorrow. Yes. All right. Okay. All right. See you tomorrow. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Linklair.